Hi, I'm Donna Sloan, and I'll be talking about transcriptomic drug repositioning for neurological symptoms of COVID-19. Because of the urgency of the pandemic, there's been a lot of work on repositioning existing drugs for use in treating COVID-19 patients in order to develop treatment options more rapidly. COVID-19 affects many organs and systems, but here we are particularly interested in understanding and treating effects of the virus on the brain, both short-term effects like strokes or changes in taste and smell, and longer-term complications like brain fog or increased psychiatric diagnoses. There are many methods of drug repositioning, several of which rely on transcriptomic data, but historically these approaches have been somewhat less effective for neurological disorders. One of the most common approaches to transcriptomic drug repositioning is called connectivity mapping. The idea is to create a database characterizing the transcriptomic effect on cells of treatment with various drugs, and then to build a query reflecting the transcriptomic effect of a disease on relevant cells, and to try to find drugs in the database that reverse the query effect. So that genes that are upregulated in disease are downregulated by the drug and vice versa. But the data we use for this matters a lot. We and others have shown that which cells you use for connectivity mapping has a big effect on what you find. And the query data matters too. Here we use two public RNA sequencing data sets characterizing the virus's effect on brain cell models, one in neurons and one in choroid plexus organoids. The choroid plexus is made up mostly not of neurons, but of epithelial cells, producing cerebrospinal fluid and creating a sort of barrier or filtration system controlling the cerebrospinal fluid's interface with the brain. For the database, we use not the original connectivity mapping data on microarrays, but the newer LINCS connectivity data set that measures transcription of about 1,000 genes via an assay known as the L1000. We use a subset of the data with about 1,300 drugs and 80 cell types, but the problem is that even this data set is very sparse. About 75% of the cell drug combinations are missing. In particular, in neurons, nearly 60% of the drugs were not assayed. So we imputed the missing connectivity data using a recommender system approach, where instead of predicting users' ratings of different movies, say, based on other users' ratings in different categories, we predict drug connectivity in cells where the drug wasn't tested. This work is described in a bioarchive preprint with lead author Diana Sapochnik, but here we're just using the imputed data in neurons. For the choroid cells, there really are no suitable cells in the database to compare to. However, there is evidence that transcription in kidney epithelial cells with a similar filtration role is comparable to that in choroid plexus epithelial cells. So we used one such cell line called HA1E and also two epithelial lung cancer cell lines from the database. Our hope was to find some consistency among the two brain cell types to identify candidate drugs and mechanisms causing neurological symptoms generally. We're just listing the top 10 drugs here and on the poster, but you can see that they differ in the four cell types queried, one for neurons and the other three for the organoid data. Note that three of these top 10 drugs in neurons and about 59% overall of the drugs in neurons rely on imputed data, including podophilotoxin here, um, which is known to have antiviral effects. But there's little overlap in the differentially expressed genes, which is perhaps not surprising, nor in the top drugs on each list. And you can see in the Venn diagram of the top 5% of connected drugs, so that goes further into the list than shown here, that there really are few drugs shared between neurons in any of the other cell types. So the intersection here is relatively low. But when we use drug bank to look at the targets of the top 5% of drugs, there's a lot of overlap. So one can examine the targets themselves to identify the most important brain functional processes affected by the disease. We decided to further interpret these using a gene network structure based on consensus modules from our method that won a recent dream challenge on finding functionally coherent modules in biological networks. And we looked for modules enriched for these shared targets. And we found several. The ones I want to focus on that I think are most interesting are these two, which actually have links joining them together, not shown here for clarity. These contain genes from VEGF and other growth factor receptor pathways that play a role in angiogenesis, or blood vessel development. So the nodes in purple here are in targets from both cell types. Red is just choroid, and green is just neurons. We also found similar module enrichment related to T cell chemotaxis, calcium ion homeostasis, and some SARC family protein tyrosine kinases, 
based on kinase inhibitors developed for cancer, but some of which have known antiviral roles as well. So what I find most interesting about all this is the focus on angiogenesis in the brains of COVID patients. It's known that there is increased microvascular injury in patients' brains. And there are clinical trials of VEGF inhibitors in pulmonary complications of the disease, but none so far with brain-related clinical endpoints. So we're working with colleagues to further characterize the effects of some of these drugs in in vitro models of brain infection and the role these processes play. I want to especially thank D. Joe, who led this work, and Diana Sapochnik, Rebecca Newman, and Michael Petrus for their work on connectivity imputation. Thanks so much.